everything you wanted to know about the dogs, you just didn't have whom to ask. And my name is Sasha Risa, I'm going to be your host today. And we're going to dive into a very interesting topic about how humans interact with the dogs and how the dogs pick up our uh, intentions and our words and our actions and how do they process them and why and the very interesting topic today I want to bring in is that actually every intention of the outside force on anybody like including ours but of course the dogs as well tends to resist the body resist any change the body is resisting the change why because of the brain is programmed to do so so whatever we want to change, either it's in our life or in our environment or our diet or our, uh, account on the, uh, our accounts in the banks and everything, our brain is resisting it. And you oftentimes find yourself circling around in the life circles, uh, in the relationships, in the money, in the, in the jobs, in whatever type of the life you want to touch, because there is a significant self regulating force within us, within every system, dogs included. And that's why I want to touch base today about that system, self-regulating system of balance that, sorry, just the puppy joined, <laughs> the, puppy, the puppy came back. So the self-regulating system of the body and any system that's called homeostasis. So that's what we're going to go over today. So the homeostasis has its in a uh, very important role in resisting the change. Why every single change is resisted? It's because we survived up to this point in an environment and in a surrounding that we actually live in. And that's because there is a self-regulating system within us and within every single system within the system. And also that counts not only for the human body and every other animal body, it's count for the systems like uh, countries, families, uh, clubs, every single, si the, the companies, every single system has its own homeostasis. Because what's the, what's the, what's the big secret of every, everyday life that our surrounding and our, our, our environment usually tends to force us to change, to adapt. And then the body, if can adapt, will survive, or if can adapt to the certain level within those range, within the range of the homeostasis, where the homeostasis got let the change happen, and it's all governed by the brain and by this system. So, uh, what we need to understand is how this self-regulating mechanism works. So, every, every single time when we know that it exists and it, it can be proven, for example, you have a, a 37 degrees Celsius of, of, of the body temperature and it can go a little bit high or it can go a little bit below so everything in between let's say 37.5 uh, 36.5 or 37.5 the, the, hu the humans or the body feels good uh, above that range or below that range we feel sick and that's exactly when you go to take your blood test, every single thing is within the range. And the body tends to regulate itself to adjust to the change that the outside environment that we live in, and our dogs live in together with us, has forced to be changed. If the homeostasis can adapt to the certain change, the life continues. If cannot, the life, the dead, that arrives. So that's where oftentimes uh, significant and quantum leaps in our life are impossible. The, the homeostasis turns to be like autopilot. We tend to get out from the diet and then like five months later we yo-yo back even gaining more than we had because of the homeostasis. We don't understand the, the quantum leap can't happen. All, on, on the other side you have it with the money too. You have a lot of millionaires that will overnight reach uh, abundance of like a high number of the, of, of the money on the ticket lottery. What happens to all of those people in a couple of years? They are back to the same thing. 
So let's dive into, into understanding how the homeostasis work and then how we can use that knowledge by knowing how it operates to adjust the shift and pressure on change on dogs and on us as well, but I'm gonna focus on the dogs this, morning, this night, but it you know, counts to any single living organism with the central nervous system because this is operation of the brain and the control centers that are stored in our brain and the spinal cord. So what do we need in order for the homeostasis? First, we need a stimulus. So the stimulus actually we called is change in the environment. So that would be change in the environment. Change in the environment. And I'm going to use today like very simple way of how the sun shines and how the sun increases the temperature how the sun shines on us and increase the temperature and then what happens within the body so the body adjusts because on the temperature uh, it's very it's very easy to understand but same principle we're going to later on understand through how the humans as a stimulus a stimulus to the dogs and I, I i have apologized to the to the instagram viewers because you are seeing the you're seeing it uh, opposite on the other side but if you can follow it would be also good to understand as well so because I have my selfie camera on. So uh, we need a stimulus. So let's see, what is, a, what is a stimulus? I'm gonna see here, there is a sun and the sun shines up to, to us. And what happened? The sun is increasing the temperature. So outside force changes and a change in the outside environment increases the temperature. What we need then next? Then the stimulus is sent, the receptor The receptor picks the signal and then sends it to the control center. Control center. So the receptor picks pick the change. And then there is the control center is processing the change. And then the control center is sending it to the effector. Then going to actually trigger the reaction. So the effector can be a cell. It can be a hormone. Or it can be a muscle, for example. So let's see what's happened when the sun shines to the body. Every single thing, like majority of the things we can pick through the senses from the outside force, but something we don't have a senses for. For example, there is no receptors for the UV light. So that's why we go out in the, in the sun and we stay there and it's maybe not sunny at all, but it's UV light is very high and if we don't check it on, the, on, the, on those phones, smartphones, things like that, we won't be able to pick up a level of the UV radiation to us and then we're going to end up burned. Because why? We didn't know that we need to move away from the from the, from, from, um, from, from sun. So that's very important to understand. We almost have like majority to detect a lot of things. You know, some things on the other side, we might also don't have a receptor to pick up, um, you know, those um, coxes of uh, poisoning that comes from the gas that you just don't know, you, you don't feel it and you just end up dying. What's the name of that? We have all of the yet carbon monoxide because it's a gas, we don't smell it, it's nothing to, nothing to uh, kind of like, nothing to um, receive those signals with, no, no, no color, no smell, no nothing, and when it poisons us enough, like we are dead. So that's why we need to have a rec receiver, receptor that's outside of our body. So, um, so when, the, when the sun shines, let's, let's go to this one, what the, the, the receptors of, for the heat and for the temperature are in our skin, and now the skin, temp the, the skin feels the temperature of the outside force, is sent signal to the control center in the brain. The control center decides, hey, what should we do now? Oh my God, the body is heating up. Okay, let's send a signal to the effector 
And then E factor would be, in this sense, it would be the, the, the glands of the skin that starts to, um, how you say that, uh, starts to sweat, sweat glands of the skin. And with letting out the, the, the <clears throat> water from the body, it will start cooling down. So actually what happens here is that uh, now the effector with this idea of what should be done, that's actually um, uh, decided by the control center in the brain. What happens here is that that's called like negative effect response. Why? Because the, the, the sun get us increased and then the effect was doing, it, it has a negative response to the, to the change of the environment that forced our body to cool down. On the other side, if this would be, uh, it, this would be a cool day that snows, then we would have like a, uh, we, the drop down of the temperature outside. And then also would be the same, the receptor gonna, gonna, oh my God, it's cold. The control center would be say, oh, it's cold. What should be done? Okay, Stim uh, make a stimulus of the muscles. So the muscles start to contract, we, st we start shivering. And there you go again. It's again, negative response to a homeostasis, to, to a change, to the environmental change. So on the other side, there is also a positive response. But positive response um, is not as much as often, but also happens, for example, uh, in a birth. When the birth is happening, then, then uh, the little baby head is pushing the cervix. The cervix stretches. And then there, there is a, there is a recept. Now, now the baby's head is a stimulus. The receptors are the nerves that are in the cervix of the, of the, of the uterus outside. And then we have control center again, gets a signal. Oh my God, like the baby wanna go out. What do we do? What do we do? Go effector would be a, uh, uh, oxytocin. So it says pump the oxytocin. So we help cervix stretches even more. So that's a positive response, but usually in the homeostasis, everything tends to balance. So usually the response on the outer, outer change, because this is inner change, it's something that happens within the body, that's usually the body helps happen even more. On the other side, outside forces that, that what tends to change like this heat or, 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 or a cold, it's actually have a negative response of the body in order to try to balance itself. <clears throat> so why this is very important to understand when, when it comes to a communication with the dogs? Because the same thing apply in the human dog interaction. Why? Because the humans are the stimulus to the dog's control centers. So what the control centers gonna done depend on a couple of things. One is uh, experience of the dog itself. And the second one is the dogs being witness of the circumstances in which some they care for was forced by environment to do a significant change, experiencing pain or almost dying. And then why now, why now uh, the, the brain itself and the control center itself preventing us from doing a change if we are afraid of something, if the control center recognized the possibility of the fear always gonna always there is uh, the the f a factor to that space would be cortisol level spiking high uh, lowering the immune system spiking up the glucose in the blood and reacting to the environmental stress through three things run away freeze or fight so what all of this has to do with change in the dog's behavior because it's a not a dog's behavior that's wrong or the dogs are doing this because they are um, like spoiled or aggressive or this or that, it's their way of responding to the environmental force to change. And why the body resists? Because of the control centers are programmed to resist because it's a negative response to anything that wants to change the system from within. It's not because the dog wants or don't want, it's because they are programmed to do so.
And if we want to reprogram their behavior, we need to deal with the control centers. And how do we deal with that? It's explained with a number of experiments in the past, of which the most important one, and oftentimes very missed, uh, misinterpreted is a Pavlov experiment that he conducted far back in 1897. But more importantly, I'm gonna come back, touch back, and I'm gonna just uh, just give you here a Pavlov experiment. Uh, 1897, and then later on he got 18, uh, 1904 he got Nobel Prize for that, for, that, for that job he did, so that's very important and significant, but that job, the, he got actually Nobel Prize for the, for, for the, for the physiology, where actually his uh, teachings and his uh, study was mainly used in tube psychology. But what I want to talk about here today is exactly connection in between two of those things, because he was awarded for the Nobel Prize in physiology, but his work is used into psychology. And why those two things are connected is because exactly that's what's happening. Because of the so-called self-regulating system known as homeostasis. When the outside force forces the body and to change, it's not only change its behavior, it's changing its physiology. So the dog cannot learn anything and the dog cannot express anything they learned until their physiology changes first. How is it going to change? Through the negative response to an outside force. Whatever we do, the body reacts on the opposite way. Whatever we try to do, the body reacts on the opposite way, slowly changing the dog's physiology, changing the control center's position about the certain, like, memory about a certain uh, experience, and then the control center gonna change the effector that gonna trigger different hormones, different muscles, different decisions. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna, and then the Pavlov experiment was very interesting. Every, everything of us know that as a classical conditioned experiment where it says like, if you give the dog the food and then you put next to it, the, if you give the dog the food, the dog gonna salivate. If you ring the bell or do whatever you want next to the dog, the dogs probably won't do nothing if he doesn't get scared. But then when you combine those two uh, stimulus, Stimuli, I get stimuli, that's how you call the plural, right? P if you combine those two stimuli, then you're gonna have a food that produces salivation, and then you have a ring combined with the food that actually tells that this can be a conditioning that if I continue to, uh, <clears throat> to do these things long enough, that I can control and I can impact the control center of the dog's body that are gonna associate. Um, the <clears throat> ringing with the food. So <clears throat> after a certain time, if I remove the food and keep ringing, the dogs gonna the dogs will be able to remember and salivate as well. But what's very important, Pavlov's conclusion to that entire picture was, uh, <clears throat> is that he was uh, telling that this cannot actually be used too much into a into the education because of so-called phenomena of spontaneous recovery. So spontaneous recovery means that if you pull out the primary stimulus, what was a food, creating uh, glands to, uh, to, to salive, is that how you say? Salivate. Salivate, okay. And if you keep ringing to the dog, he will keep salivating until the certain time. And after that, the stimulus recovery is going to tend to e decrease salivation because the primary stimulus is not present anymore. So, <clears throat> and then he said, classical conditioning cannot be used in the education because it doesn't produce enough learning curve that actually calls for literally physiological change of the brain. The myelin is missing from the brain if only conditioning is in place. So we cannot 
teach anything by conditioning it to do so, because the physiological change to it, it's not enough to keep bringing the positive impact forward. So what you need in order to train anyone, you need impact. Impact that's gonna be stressful enough to Im or painful enough or uh, kind of like um, scary enough to choose to, to do the immediate imprint of the control center telling if you pull, you're gonna feel this. If you do this, you're gonna feel this. Instead of feeling it, the dog freezes in time because it's already stress response. It's not a learning curve. It's not a conditioning curve. It's a stress response. If the trauma was impacted and hard enough or was provided to the certain degree of so-called not as stressful as much, but also was imprinted for enough long period of time, it's gonna embed self not in a learning curve, but in a stress response. That explained, and a very important study was done by the, I, I guess like that was the most controversial scientist of New Age that actually opened the, opened the, <clears throat> his study was very interesting and important for us today, but he opened door for the, for the, for the Nazis to do their job um, in, in <laughs> during the Second World War. It's called uh, Dr. Watson. So Dr. Watson was a very important scientist of the mid, uh, of the beginning of the 20th century. You'd be logged out. Why is that? What? I said I, I, be log I, I, I was logged out. Oh my God. Did you do something? No. Because some, I just logged out. Just a second. I'm sorry. Why am I logged out? Can you just do whatever is going on here? Okay, I'm sorry. I just want to get back to my audio. Oh, it's going. <clears throat> I don't know. Something is going on. Never mind. I'll keep doing. So the Dr. Watson, uh, can you just put me back so we can uh, restart my phone so we can just get back or use yours or something like that, please? So it says like Dr. Watson was uh, doing his... Um, a PhD in University of Chicago, a very important study that he conducted in uh, 1913 that's called Animal Education. Animal Education, it's a not a long study, it's kind of like around like 100 and something pages. I encourage you to read it so you can get a better sense of what's the difference in between imprinting the trauma and getting results through something that's going to leave enough imprint in the dog's brain so the dog control centers in response to that is actually taking over and resist the change and doesn't resist the change because it's um, the, it's actually the <clears throat> stress response it's not a learning curve that's very important and the pavlov conclusion of the Pavlov experiment. If you read it just to read it and you know everyone knew it, because, oh, he gave the dog this and then he rang the bell. And the, but if you really dive in into reading it, into studying, his own conclusion was you cannot use it for the learning because it's a conditioning, it's not an education. It's condition, it's a response, it's a stress response. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a homeostasis because exactly, he said, spontaneous recovery comes into the place. Oftentimes, we would use that as an excuse to imprint the shock to the dogs or not imprint a big shock, but imprint over the time a little amounts of the shock that's gonna be like, I don't know, color pooling or, or those coral color, how do you call those, uh, better than, how, prong. How, prong colors or um, <clears throat> the whatever, E colors. Oh, it's, it's just a little, it's never a little. If, if it's a little, why are we using it? Why do we need a tool to communicate with the dogs? If we want to communicate, then use a language, a body, body language, use a body language, use a signal language, use anything that means communicate. 
don't force the communication. Don't try to think that if and blame the Pavlov experiment for everything that you are doing because you just didn't dive into understanding what he, act, what he actually concluded. Because he concluded that it cannot be used for the education because it doesn't change his physiology enough. He, on the contrary, he said, if the, <clears throat> it's important to understand, conditioning will be never forgotten. If you bring back the, the stimuli again, and then it's happening so-called a, 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 a sec second ex extinction period. Second extinction period comes in a much lower response to the primary stimuli, and as further you go from the stimuli connection, the less and less and less and less extinction it will be given doesn't mean that the dog won't, in, in time to come, won't drop enough saliva that you can say, oh my god, the dogs are uh, doing a salivation or the dogs are not doing a salivation. You will always be to find a connection because that's forever, but, there, but the experience of foreverness is actually turning it down. And then the secondary, third, and whatever experienced uh, inst uh, uh, how you call it, extinction period is going on. It's uh, <clears throat> let me just start it here again. Sorry, sorry, people. I just want. I don't know why did I why did I do this. <clears throat> so that's where the. That, that's where all of this is coming from, very importantly. All of this is coming from, from and then the Watson, uh, 1913, laid his, uh, his, his, his feet on the Pavlov study and conducted animal education. That was his PhD and he was impressed and he wanted to take it further from where the, where the Pavlov left. Pavlov didn't <laughs> left, he was still around, uh, and then, but he was taking his, his work uh, forward. So what he did is he was having a two groups of the rats. One group of the rat was just fed, and the other one was learning how to get to be fed. So they needed to solve the puzzle. They needed to touch this and then to open something. Then they needed to solve the labyrinth. Then they needed to do a lot of things in order to get to the food. They were not forced to do. They were learning to come to the, to the, to the, to the food. So the, the control group was, not, was just fed. And the study group was learning how to get to the food. On the different stages, he was conducting the section. Uh, how you say? He was he was conducting, you know, checking in the body, like killing them, of course, and then cutting their brain. And he wanted to see is the education on its own changes the physiology of the of the of the, of the brain. And he was right. And that was a very huge discovery, where it says. That the, <clears throat> that the amount of the myelin, and the myelin is a fat surface that, that stays um, over the axon, and in order to understand that, that would be our next topic to talk, is about how this signal actually happens. When the dog sees something, or when the dog hears something, or when something in outside world happens, where actually we talk about the stimulus, when that happens, and humans are the stimulus to the dogs, because we are talking to them, we are, we are behaving with them, we are forcing them to do something, or we are criticizing them, or we are loving them, whatever we do to them goes to the same process of the, so the stimulus, receptor, control center, and effector. So that's how it's communicated. But in order for us to be able to visualize, you really literally need to dive in into understanding how that uh, interesting, and it's so interesting topic for me, I was like nerd, and then like finally I didn't know why the heck I need all of this. And, but on the end it pays its role in my, in my own understanding of the human dog uh, interaction to understand like how we can blend with the dogs so easily and so deeply and so, uh, so profoundly like with never, no other animal we can do. Uh, and then, you know, you have a lot of theories that are gonna slowly dive into this. Uh, a couple of my very important mentors, one of which would be a Ray Coppinger, the other one, a very important one uh, is, uh, <clears throat> um, oh my god, Rupert Sheldrick that was talking about, again, you'll be logged out. Why? Okay, I, I, check. I cannot go with this. <clears throat> um, so, I'm sorry for this one. You don't want to try again? There you go.
I'm sorry for the Facebook. <laughs> we can maybe uh, cut this later on for the Facebook people, for the Instagram people. So what he, what he came up to the conclusion, it says the control group doesn't have as much as million. And, uh, and why I'm talking about this now, because I'm going to next time, I'm going to talk about what happens inside the brain of the dog, how and inside the brain of ours, like how this signal that's actually catched by the receptor is transmitted through the nerve cell and how actually that on the end, because that's very interesting chemical and electronic, uh, electrical reaction that happens within the brain and the speed of travel and the way of how the signal goes through the exact point or where, where the information of the control center is what to be done, what to be done with this and how to be processed is stored within the brain. But in order for us to visualize that, so once you visualize how, how this wonderful net of the dog's brain is actually catching the signals and how it's processed, where it goes, what it does, and how the dogs actually respond. Only it's all on, uh, it's all, all based on this self self preser self preservation of the system itself called homeostasis. So what the Watson concluded in animal education was actually an amazing discovery that actually by learning, not being conditioned, by learning a certain trait learning a certain point, combining two things into third one, having a chance to choose on their own increases the number of the, not the number of the brain cells, increases the, the, the amount of the, of the uh, myelin shields, uh, sheets over the axon that actually increases the speed of the signal sent through the nervous cell. So, and then that, that one, very important one, the, this study of the animal education led to another experiment that he was very famous but criticized also for, called Little Experiment, uh, so Little Albert. Little Albert, he conducted 1920. So at 1920, he conducted this Little Albert experiment that was very cruel to the little baby that he was Maybe I can just start it like this. And, okay, I guess um, life. Um, and the little Albert experiment was a little cr cruel one because it was co conducted on the baby. The baby was called Albert, and he and his uh, co-worker, his collab guy, uh, Russell, Russell, Russell. I don't know what's his name. I, I was always like I was always uh, learning about. I was reading a lot about his studies. He was so cruel. But never mind. Nevertheless, he was conducting this very important study that I draw your attention to, and I encourage you to read it because it's so. Um, how can I say? It's so cruel on its own. So what uh, what what did he do with the with the little Albert? So he was taking a little baby. He borrowed the baby from the mom that was working as a nurse in the in the hospital. He was conducting his research on. It was a I think a, how you say that neurological hospital, Physi yeah neurological hospital. And then the baby was normal, completely normal little healthy baby of six months and he said like okay and he paid to the mom like he she, he paid her like one dollar for that experiment at that time so she handed the baby to them and the first part of the experiment was that he handed to the baby uh, some sort of like uh, interesting toys we are locked out again Oh, uh, that we, we got some little toy, he showed her little toys and he, uh, the, he, the baby was uh, little animals, like a little rat and then little monkey and the little uh, rabbit. rabbit, bunny little, and then the baby was just curious. The baby was just going there and touching the, 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 those animals as much as he was able to and then the little bear and all kind of those things, the baby was acting normally. The second part of the experiment was that the moment the baby touches the, those, uh, those objects, those babies or those rats or whatever, he would make a noise in the sherpe, on, in the pots, right? To create an amazing noise. The moment the baby touches, the, touches the, the, those, those things. So what happened there is that the baby's response that Albert developed was so high in the in in a, in a, in, a, in a response that the baby was not able anymore in just a couple of days like that that part of the experiment lasted i think like less than a week uh, creating this stress environment that you was not able to put near near a baby anything that's white 
So the baby was frantically scared of the white walls, of the white sheets, of the white uh, clothes, and he wouldn't stop crying and stop being anxious in the surrounding that was familiar to the little brain maybe it might cause the same scarcity or the same fear that was caused by this big noise that uh, um, Watson was conducting during the experiment. With that said, the mother got scared and she took the baby ran away. Uh, Albert uh, was later on, so that's kind of like a destiny of little boy, that he died in age in between 9 and 10. Uh, even though the Watson and his team was ever said that, oh, it's unknown what happened to the little Albert, uh, his idea was to actually recondition this fear, so he didn't end up to, he didn't came to uh, finish the experiment. But what was very important, he, and he blamed the mom because she ran away with the baby. So that was, uh, that was his uh, saying, like, oh my God, if she would not run away, I would be able to re-engineer the baby's brain. So the interesting thing there is how the, bra how the baby developed such a big fear of the, towards, towards these things so fast is because babies has a very high, very high intensity of the neuroplasticity and they can learn very fast because their brain is open to adapting to the certain environment because that's what the baby do. The baby observe, the baby listen, the baby see, the baby hear, baby smell, baby touch and that is how they're observing, building up the memories of the brain that are not coming from the epigenetics or from the, uh, they are coming actually from the environment and not an epigenetic, but an environment, and they are coming from the uh, uh, experience, like a personal experience, and also the memory can hold up the uh, witnessed experience. So not necessarily need to be mine, but it can be my mom's, my dad's, my whoever, whoever creates this first circle of the baby's life. So all of that leaves, uh, leaves, um, leaves a mark in the baby's uh, response and the baby's life. So very important thing here is to uh, to understand that uh, oh oh um, but the, the critics of the Watson said that no bet that the baby died in age of nine or ten because the damage done to the brain at such a early age that actually. It's, and it's very interesting that the memory and the records that talks about the mother later on found uh, express that this little boy that died of age in between 9 and 10 died of hydrocephalus. Exactly damage of the brain that the critics of the Watson said it was done by the experiment itself. But that's also, it's very important to connect those two experiments because animal education was proving that the brain cells change its structure by learning about a certain traits. By keep using those traits and those uh, messages, the brain expands so the control center can react much faster to the change in order to provide a desirable outcome. And what's a desirable outcome? Always contrary to the effect or in real situation, positive, positive uh, response to the stimuli provided. <clears throat> and this is the most important part to understand, what is the difference in between learning and conditioning and how the learning is increasing the mental capacity of the dogs to make their own decisions because the dogs do have a prefrontal cortex that they are using. It's still 3%, it's not as big as ours. We have like almost 12 to 15, depends on the source you are reading. So let's say 12 to 15% of it, it's our prefrontal cortex. And the decision is always made in the triangle that connects three things like hypothalamus, amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Amygdala as a scanning the situation, the sixth sense looking beyond the eyes and senses, always trying to find the places that might damage us and might remind us of the memories that a hypothalamus stores as something that uh, we experienced or we got as an, uh, got as a, as a, as a, as a, as a epigenetic or we witnessed to be seen, we witnessed something and it was enough impact to us so store, memory is stored. That's exactly how the memory can be stored of imprint, of conditioning of the trauma. And sometimes if we use force, whatever type of the force, harder force, harder force using will embed the higher imprint and the thing gonna be learned faster 
if the force or trauma done to the brain and body would be painful enough for to do so. On the, on the other side, the same token lies for something that's actually constantly done, but not in a significant or high force. But if constantly done, the body reacts the same way. So what would be the response of the dogs of this, on these methods that we use in a training? Oftentimes, it would be which of three what do you think? Like which of three possible actions? So how does this help? The stimulus to this is a pain. Slightly, little pain or big pain, whatever. So, so discomfort, let's call it discomfort. So the stimulus is discomfort. So what happens to the discomfort? The receptor of the body, that's around the neck, receives the discomfort. Prong collar, e collar, choke collars, or things that are, or punishment of any kind. So force on the skin. Receptors gonna call that. Control center gonna see, uh, get them. Then the, then the, then it goes through the, through the, through the, through the, uh, through the, through the program actually, looking for the solution for this problem. So how do I fix the solution? Don't pull. So the effector would be the dog is not pulling. But how the dog decided not to pull? What happens? Because you remember that something of this can be a muscle, can be a, the effector can be a cell, can be a hormone, and can be a muscle. If we, so the muscle would be on the end, something that don't pull, so there is no driving force. But because the dogs pull on leash, not because they want to pull on leash or they are misbehaved, the dogs are pulling on leash because the memory they have about that scanning amygdala is doing the scan over the, over the world they are living in with us, is actually noticing a missing component of the very important part of the group survival, a leader. So if the human communicates by their behavior that they are not leader, the dog's going to try to protect the group by taking a shoe of the leader and that's why they are pulling on the leash. It's a sign of I'm going in front of my group so I'll be able to protect you from whatever comes. So they are, and no matter how hard you try pulling them back, you cannot make an, uh, the dogs get more and more and more and more anxious. Why? Because they want to protect you. And if they want to protect you, they might need to kill someone. And how the, how the body responds to that is to releasing a high level of cortisol. So if you want to stop the dog by pulling it or putting anything on them by creating a slight force or slight information that this is undesirable behavior, you're going to trigger the same thing. A cortisol spikes again in the dog's body. And how the dog reacts? You have a dog that might be... Um, might be like running away. The dogs don't run away from the humans because usually the humans are source of their survival. So the running away from this situation is not an option. If you keep, if you have an aggressive dog that you're working with and you're using a force to lower the aggression and you are a very clever trainer, so the dog clearly know when it's gonna hurt him if he behaves the undesirable way, then the dog again, you think the dog willingly chooses to do that? No, the dog is forced to choose to give up on aggression. So what is the third option that the dogs are able to choose out from the possibility, the body, the control center is able to use out from the three options that the body responds to the stress situation can be freeze, it's the only option that stays. So how the dog behave when they freeze? They do everything we want them to do. It's the same way that the, the dogs in a circus was trained and the lions in circuses were trained and everyone in the circuses were trained. It's because that's the way how the animal education is old fashioned way observed and a Pavlo experiment partially surf surfacy and superficially understood. Because the Pavlov itself, in the conclusion of the experiment, when you read his books, when you read his explanations, when you really dive in into his research, he said the conditioning is not education. And if the rat can change itself, and it's proven, and the, the, the Watson didn't say the rat education, his PhD called animal education. And he claims that every single animal can be taught, can learn, and by learning increases and changes the physiology of the brain, producing control centers by will, by, by, not by will, by, by the outcome.
without being forced to do so, and it comes out by will. Where in contrary, we can still teach dogs to do something by conditioning them. What the Pavlov said, it's not the way to learn, because the conditioning slowly devaluate. What remains if the dog remain in the, in the way of, of behaving properly, by being conditioned to behave properly, being trained to, to condition to, be, uh, to behave properly? What they are not going out from is a state of freeze. And the state of freeze increases the cortisol, puts the dog in a mode of the chronic stress, the chronic stress impacts the physiology of the body because a lot of, lot of, lot of um, um, uh, bio, not the biomechanical, but biochemical reactions are happening in that way because the cortisol within the body triggers a lot of things. So what can be outcome? Your dog might behave, but they might have an infected ear, they might have an allergies, they ha have, can, can have an, uh, uh, lower, lower immune system, they can, might have a, you know, uh, leaky eyes that are you know, crying and they have a, those red stains, they have, might have a problem with the perineal glands, they might have, have, a, uh, have a dental plaque, all of that because the thyroid gland doesn't work or it's hyperactive or not active and you have a lot of free minerals flowing around the body unused from the food. Why? Because the do dog's body spikes and hyped into a cortisol. The cortisol has a very important part because the cortisol and adrenaline that spikes first, so it's kind of like a, how it goes, the hypothalamus, um, uh, pituitary gland, um, adrenaline gland, uh, that's, that's the way how the hormones, hormone uh, does, how the hormone is released, and then adrenaline gland releases adrenaline that triggers release of the cortisol. Once the cortisol in a, in a, in a body, the glucose spikes high, so it impacts the pancreas as well because the insulin tries to lower the glucose, but then the glucose is there because the cell doesn't want to so when, when usually we eat something or a dog eats something and it does dissolve into, um, from, the, from, the, from the carbohydrates, it dissolve, di dissolve into, a, into a sugar, into a glucose, then the glucose gets into the bloodstream and enough glucose in the bloodstream releases the hormone called insulin. The insulin gets out from the, from the pancreas and then opens the cell. The insulin is a key to open the gate through which glucose can enter the cell. Once the glucose enters the cell and it's enough uh, for, the, for, the, for the life of the cell itself, it stores itself in the glycogen. So there is a chain of little glycogen within the, within the, within the cell that's stored there just in case, in certain time, that we won't have an access to the food. So once the glycogen is created within the cell and the cell has enough uh, energy to work and live, the shot, the, the insulin wouldn't work anymore. And if glucose keep coming into the bloodstream without being able to penetrate the cell because the, because the, uh, the, the cell is already closed the gate, but on the other hand, we have a glucose that sends the signal to the pancreas, we need more insulin. So what's the outcome of that is insulin resistance. Because the glucose, and why, why, is the, why is the cortisol keeping the glucose within the blood? Because that's the food for the brain. And why the brain need the food? Because we need to make a decision. We are in a stressful situation. What decision is to make? Will we run away? Will we freeze here until the, uh, the, the stimuli doesn't move away? Or we need to fight? But why the dogs are, and any animal is choosing fight the latest one? Because that's the, that's the moment where you can kill someone but also be killed. So whenever it's a possibility to avoid um, uh, fight, the body chooses first to uh, freeze or uh, first would be fly away, but dogs don't have where to fly and they wouldn't choose that as the little children would. If you, if you have a little child in an abusing family, the child doesn't have where to run, cannot confront the parents because it's too small for that. So what the children do? The children freeze. And that's the way how they can survive the, the, the abusive environment, just freeze.
oftentimes we, we became in love with our abusers. So we don't confront them and we don't do nothing in order to run away. It's not big. And then you have like, oh, why you, why you, why you kept this <clears throat> abusive relationship for so long? Why you didn't left him? Why you didn't do why? Because the brain prevented us to do so because we froze in time in order to survive. And that's how oftentimes later on in life you can, you can, uh, we can develop actually HD uh, attention deficit disorder because all of that trauma we went through doesn't allow us to, to participate properly in the, in the environment because we uh, can be afraid of uh, going again through the situation. And also that's what uh, was the Watson was also giving a uh, uh, adding to the Pavlov experiment was that uh, uh, cl cl classic conditioning is oftentimes done by unconscious stimulus. So something, and oftentimes when we are practicing with our dogs, we need to be completely present and aware about everything that's going on around the dogs. Because oftentimes I see when I, when, I, when I work with my clients is that oftentimes they would be, do perform these you know, rituals, like a feeding ritual, uh, re uh, reuniting and uh, going and coming ritual, how they go out from the home, how they come back from home, and then the walking and the playtime ritual. But also when they send me the video and when we go to the chat cup, I would see that a ritual is not performed properly. And that's why the dog doesn't have the trust to their parents yet. And that's why, why we developed um, why we developed the canine communication card, so you will be able to very easily have this idea of when what. So when this happens, what I do? Am I doing it correctly? So we nailed it into those cards and you can order them on the link that actually Gona Veteran just post in the comments so you can uh, grab your part of the very beautifully design designed cards. And those cards are helping you actually get to the core of the of the idea of what actually uh, the it's a tool the the the, uh, the, the communication cards is a tool but the real uh, real program that I also invite you to check on it's a doggy parents academy where we use based on all of this research and real science that actually is a very logical way to understand is how do we impact the life of our dogs and also you can go to our uh, institute page that also veteran can leave you in the comments and it's just myplh.com myplh.com one word myplh.com and when you hit there you're gonna you will be able to see the institute uh, of pure love and harmony that actually uh, specializes and has interest into a human dog relationship and we study a lot of we bring a lot of new light uh, combining the ancient studies as this one into the modern world uh, environment in which those cruel experiments can be translated so we bring new light to the to the uh, experiments that cannot be performed again, but what we can learn from them actually, because they are very cruel both to the humans and to the animals, but we can learn and give those animals and that little Albert and all of those, those people that sacrifice, and animals that are sacrificed for us to know something about what's going on and really dive into understanding those things. And as I said, like PLH, like Pure Love and Harmony, is always connected into this big picture where we combine uh, communication, nutrition and the code care into a holistic system that will fit your lifestyle. Because the you is something that makes your dog unique. Your relationship is something that creates this homeostasis of your dog work for or against you. And if you are not aware of how high stimulus you are to your dog, then you don't have, and exactly this explains a lot, questions about how do, which breed do I pick? Which breed is that? And which breed is this? <coughs> the modern environment of the human dog relationship and so close connection doesn't care about the breed anymore. Talking breed specific traits are only a talent that might or might not be expressed and uh, uh, extracted from the dog's characteristic. But if we, uh, if we let the dog be a dog 
and then understand our role as a stimulus to the dog's life, we can very easily navigate with very gentle approach of the education of the animal, not conditioned and trained. That's very two different things that I don't have, uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't critique uh, the trainers because I'm actually nothing to do with them. I'm not working with dogs in order to teach them anything. Uh, that's the job of the trainer. What I do is, what we do at the Pure Love and Harmony, we actually do exactly that. We live the life in Pure Love and Harmony with respect, allowing dogs to have dignity, that they have their life, they have their perception, they have their mind, their little soul and emotion that need to be understood up to the the, 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 because we are conscious, more conscious in that relationship, we need to give our best in order to provide them a lovable environment in which they can then respond. Because what we can do and how we can teach the dog is uh, you can learn through the Doggy Parent Academy and you can have like... Uh, also dive on a little a lot of levels like can, you can choose the uh, to to have your you know go on your place through our online program uh, then you can choose uh, uh, to to work with us on a on the continuous subscription model so we kind of like work with a group of the people that uh, have a same call it uh, expression of the dog's behavior or dog language like a, and then we put uh, our our um, our students into the group but only doggy parents we don't care about the dogs because we know if you learn the canine language then you're going to be able to communicate it how through your behavior through then your behavior going to create your emotions towards dog and then the dog will be able literally to understand and have you as a respectful and responsible uh, owner Otherwise, everything else is like long left in history and uh, we, are, we need to understand that there is a new horizon opening ahead of us. The new way of how this world should be uh, perceived. Is it perceived? And then on the other hand, we have a lot of knowledge now to know that, um, uh, that only if understood what's going on in the dog's brain and in our brain and next time we're going to dive in into actually this idea of how the neuron is functioning and how this interaction of the sodium potassium uh, ions is actually happening within the dog's within the dog's mind and how the signal is transferred through the through the through the through the neurons and how the signal goes from i see through i express myself because that's very interesting how you, how you turn picture into a signal, how you turn a light into a signal. That's actually, this is a picture we see in the world or our dog sees in the world. And then there is an amazing reaction and a chain that triggers the chain of the reaction leading to the control centers. And when we disagree to some degree or whatever degree we're going to disagree on, what we are actually dis disagree on is our control center to the stimulus of the hurrying something I talk or I hear something you talk is actually controlled by our control center. So once our control center recognizes something that we are not in harmony with or that we resist is actually telling us that we are at the place of possible change and possible shift. Will we allow that shift to happen depends on how strong homeostasis of our brain or our body and survival mechanism is made off. And then there is a, there is a way what we also teach is a higher um, uh, experience of the pure love and harmony is a constellation of the pure love and harmony. It's a family, pet family constellation that actually dives in into emotional entanglement that happens in between human and the dogs. And if you read the book that I wrote uh, about the dogs and awakening, you can read about a lot of, lot of, um, uh, you can find it on Amazon. It's about the dogs and awakening. Then you can read about a lot of, uh, cases that are re real life cases like uh, the people were just the names were changed and the breed of the dog was changed and the, but I, I kept the I kept the synchronicity with the breed as well so it's not uh, a poodle was not compared to the Rottweiler but and then the places where the where the workshop was taking place I changed as well so the privacy of the clients will be unintact but you will see from from uh, anxiety of the dog and human to the aggression of the dog towards the baby babies in the in the home, uh, to the epileptic attacks, uh, everything of that was sold 
through the emotional detachment from the memories that through the dogs that to the dogs arrives through so-called harmonic resonance because there is, if you read the uh, scientific work uh, of, of a couple, of, like five decades of the work of an amazing uh, scientist from, uh, from, from England, Dr. Rupert Sheldrick, you will see his theory about the morphic resonance. And then on top of the morphic resonance, this has a resonance. And a mor what's morphic resonance? A morphic resonance calls for a morphic, re morphic means body or shape actually. Uh, and then the, the, the resonance mean the resonance, the resonance of the shape, right? So the dogs and the humans cannot be in a resonance of the shape. So they are not communicating because let's say this is a plate, uh, this is a resonance, this is a morphic field of the humans that connects all the humans, all of us through the space and time, connects us all because we are of the same species. So the morphic resonance connects everything that looks the same. And what looks the same and acts the same, operates on the same laws within and outside, is a species. We do the same thing. And then you can have an amorphic resonance a uh, little broader, like a morphic resonance of the species, morphic resonance of the family, of the club, of the country. Everything that someone might belong can have its own field that connects those, that has its own rules of operation. <clears throat> but when it comes to interaction of the two fields, like a dogs and humans, among themselves those fields operate within other laws. And because of my uh, great teachers and mentors through the very hard education I went through in the field of family constellation in order to work on my own traumas from childhood and on, on the other side, once I was set on that path of healing, I was able to understand and connect things that other people didn't have in a uh, pre-requested knowledge to see. So I saw how actually the dogs and people connect through some other form and forces that connect them so high and so close to each other so they feel each, each, each and every one of them like they are in love with it. But that's the, that's the place where the entanglement happen and what's not help, uh, that's not helpful and not, not even, uh, not even um, uh, uh, healthy, neither for the human, neither for the dog's life. What we do with the family constellation, or actually constellation of the pure love and harmony, we detach that, that entanglement uh, so it can come together on a healthy basis. So stay with me uh, next Thursday as well, and we're going to move on on this very exciting journey to bring together things that are actually helped me come to a conclusion about how and why the dogs and humans have such a deep bond understanding and relationship. And I just, instead of convincing you to, oh, this is how I, this is how it should be and this is what, how it is, I'm going to take, take you through the journey of my evolution, how my mind evolved through the time and space. And, and space, I can say so, and every I'll share with you every single thing that has impacted my point of view today. So if you don't agree with me now, but if you stay long enough with this channel and me, you're going to come to the same conclusion or we're going to transform this into something completely new. Because that's what the good science is about. The science, uh, and oftentimes when I get a chance to talk in these scientific communities I, and everyone that you might listen, because I also have published a couple of papers on nutrition and coach care and I have a hold a lot of patents in this area so I'm I'm pretty much scientific mindly oriented but you know once you publish the paper and you have a presentation about that the first thing you say okay this is what I think today but probably like one month from now I'm gonna completely change my mind and that's what the real science is nothing is set in stone the science always evolves because the word science means you doubt you doubt, you doubt. And if you don't doubt, then you cannot express itself. So what we need to look is a further beyond transcending something that's left so far away, Ringling Brothers theories about how the animal should be trained and the circus bear and conditioning as Pablo itself said, is not a learning curve. Conditioning is not a learning curve. And, the, and the, the Watson said the learning happens spontaneously because they cannot, they are not conditioned that if they solve the puzzle, they're going to get the food. It's not a conditioning that the food is under, behind the rainbow, uh, be, uh, uh, over the rainbow. 
It's not a conditioning. It's a puzzle to be solved. How do I get to another part of this labyrinth and how fast I can get there so my food wouldn't be eaten? And that's what gets dogs and animals in, in that learning, solving the puzzle after the puzzle. And that's what we can get to them. We don't even need this study to teach animals anything. We just need to learn ourselves that conditioning is not a way, that learning they don't need. What they need is an environment. They need a specific stimulus of the human behavior. So when they respond to our behavior in the way of I just said to you, the re response what we will get will be desirable and acceptable behavior by choice. Thank you so much for staying with me. I apologize to my, um, to my friends on Instagram. I was not able to catch up with this log being out and log yourself in and back and things like that. But anyhow, uh, this video is uh, live on Facebook and going to be uploaded to my YouTube channel. So I'm going to share it across the uh, network uh, because I really love this topic. And finally, I came to the point to talk about not convincing you why something is, but to start from the ground zero and then slowly evolve into a place where this is going to be a conclusion of our, 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 our path. And once we get them, probably what I believe today would be completely changed. Thank you so much. See you next Thursday in another episode of every, everything you wanted to know about dogs. You just didn't have whom to ask. My name is Sasha Reis. I'm happy to be your host next week as well. Enjoy. I love you and goodbye.